this is just um, so there's been a, there a handful of questions that, that there's been over the past several days, and so I'm just going to go over um, a, a bunch of things that are related to stuff we've already talked about, trying to clarify um, some small things. And so first, a, a bunch of very small things. Um, so so there, was, there was an error on the polygenic score slide lecture. Um, it's fixed, and so the new PDF for the polygenic score lecture has been corrected. The, it was the thing about the expected predictive power of a polygenic score when you go to a different cohort or a different phenotype. So that's fixed. Um, so here's, here's one point that, I, that uh, Dan wanted me to s stress a little bit that, that uh, I, I didn't really hit hard on. So if, if, the, if the weights that we're using to build our polygenic score, these B hats, if those are unbiased estimates of like the correct Bs, what that's going to mean is that the, the polygenic score, the A hat, is an unbiased estimator of the true PGS. And so that's like a nice, a nice feature. So even though our polygenic scores lead to attenuated estimates in our regressions, and the, the expected value of these scores should be approximately what the true polygenic score is. Uh, did I write the wrong thing? No, no, no. I want to know what's, what's the expected value of the true score give, uh, given, uh, the, this, is, this is the estimated polygenic score given the truth. Okay. Right? Yeah. And so it is, it is true that you know, the polygenic score will be right on average, I even though it's going to um, have additional noise attached. Um, OK, so that's, that's one thing to keep in mind in interpreting the polygenic scores that, that we produce. Next quick thing. Um, so, so in a lot of papers, um, you hear people talk about you know, a, a genetic endowment. You know, and they say the polygenic score is a person's genetic endowment. Um, and and that's, that's nice, you know, but the problem, the problem with this is I think that when we say this and even when people hear it or when, when people hear it and even when we say it, sometimes we're thinking that it, it means that it's like some innate biological thing and that the polygenic score represents like my biological risk of getting higher education and, and, and that's, that's not actually the case, right? Like remember like Jeng's critique. So, so you, can, you could call it an, a genetic endowment if you're also willing to say that like being male is a genetic endowment. Right, so it's not that like being male makes you know like there's there's differences in educational attainment between men and women, but I don't think that we would think of that as like oh yeah there's like an innate biological difference that's driving us on like these these genetic effects that make up our polygenic scores include these complicated environmental things, and so just uh, that's a an issue that, that we wanted to focus on as you're talking about this and writing about it in your papers and things like that. So that's that's language we should be very careful about using. Good. Yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, I, I think that you could talk about um, like predicted genetic risk, or and what, what language do you think is the right thing? I don't, I don't know exactly what the right thing is. Additive predicted additive genetic score. Yeah, so you could say predicted additive genetic score if you want. I mean, I think the important thing, like so, I, um, is to make sure you define whatever it is that you do, probably. I mean, like so, if you really love this terminology, make sure that you, you know, point out that you know this doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, your inherent value or I would call it a polygenic score. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could just call it a polygenic score. Oh, lots of questions about this. Uh, Bo? Yeah, yeah, I just want to comment. Uh, thanks for, for that thought actually. Uh, I was trying to not get, get into too much details when I mentioned earlier this blood property, I think. Uh, oh, for this thing. Yeah. You, you asked me uh, about the um, why do we expect that when there is when the assortment is not completely driven by mate choice, why do we expect this uh, correlation between polygenic, polygenic scores to be smaller than the phenotypic correlation between spouses? And this is only happen when we have that property, mm -hmm. uh, desirable property, what I call blood, best in your environment. Oh, but, that, but that's not the blood property. The blood property is the, 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 other, the, way the other way around. Yeah. So, so forget what I said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think the way Matt described it, it gives a good way to interpret it. It's exactly the effect of the genes given the average environment. So that includes all kinds of things like racism and sexism, which are all part of the environment. So this is what happens to you as a result of your genes in the average environment that's out there, which includes all kinds of things that are pretty pretty arbitrary. Yeah. So a lot of words is the tricky thing, right? <laughs> But, uh, um, but yeah, if you say it's a polygenic score and you say polygenic scores should be interpreted with nuance and then say everything that Miles said. 
I would, uh, I would, we, we, avoid, we don't use the word risk in our papers, it's risk for my medical Yeah, that's right. true. So, mm -hmm. even score is problematic. Yeah, <laughs> score I'm okay with. So I don't, I also don't think that this is the most, I think polygenic score is fine, but otherwise we'll we'll good into it. Yeah, lots of choices. Uh, Mark's suggestion was in that line, in saying why don't you just call genetic environmental endowment? Yeah, 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 and that's what I'm saying. So I, I'm not totally offended by this, <laughs> as long as you make it incredibly clear what you mean by that, and that it's it's apparent that by, by endowment you you also include you know sex and other kinds of things that your genes predict as 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 endowment, you know. Uh, just a, just I think just something we should we should be careful in the language that we use. Um, and, and be clear as well. Great. So um, here is the next thing I wanted to talk about. So, so um, there were some questions about what the difference is between the betas from the additive model and the little b's from the polygenic score. And so I made like this little illustration to try to show what I mean. So, so each of these bars is, is the beta, or the, yeah, is the beta from the additive genetic model. So the true causal effect of, you know, at conception swapping out the allele, right? Now, let's say in the polygenic score we don't measure SNP3. We only have SNPs, you know, 1, 2, 4, and 5. What's going to happen, you know, the, the Bs are going to be a little different because to the degree that these other SNPs tag the omitted SNP, or un, maybe not omitted, but unmeasured, you know, some of the signal is going to get passed among all of these other things. And then this little bar was supposed to show that, you know, some of the signal may not get passed at all. So, so this, this thing corresponds to the, the difference between narrow sense heritability um, and SNP heritability, the fact that we don't get all of the variants. But these bars here shows that you know, we are capturing some of, the, some of the variation even from the SNPs that we don't measure, and it's kind of scattered across all of, the, all of the SNPs that are nearby. OK, does that, yes? So does this mean that they're always going to be greater? Well, I mean, in this case, all of my betas are positive. So, you know, I mean, it won't, if, if some of these were negative, then I guess it would have subtracted out, but that would have been hard to make in a nice picture. <laughs> um, so, similarly, if we want to talk about how the GWAS betas correspond to the true betas, then it's the same kind of deal. So, in a GWAS, we only look at one SNP. And so, this SNP's going to capture a little bit of this one, and a little bit of this one, a little bit of this one. Apparently, this SNP is not an LD with SNP5, and so it's not capturing any of the signal from SNP5. But then there's also kind of a lot of residual signal that SNP1 isn't capturing in each of these. And so that's, that's actually, so I'm trying to illustrate graphically this idea here. So, so the GWAS um, beta for, for SNP J um, is just kind of the sum of all of the nearby SNPs weighted by, by how much LD there is between them. So hopefully that kind of clarifies what these differences between these different Bs and betas that we've been throwing at you all for the last week. You good? Okay, next thing. No. R squared for scores, but not, not in this case. Uh, okay, so next is um, why is R squared less than H squared SNP? Huh? Well, when we defined H squared SNP, we told you that it was the best linear predictor of the phenotype. What do we mean by best? Well, in this case, what we mean by best is it's the, it's the predictor, so it's the weighted sum of the genotypes that gives the maximum predictive power, maximizes the R squared um, between, between the, um, you know, the weighted sum and, and the phenotype. And so then why is the R squared less than this? Well, we don't know the Bs, and so we estimate them. And so they're actually equal to you know, B plus some error. Oh, I think, this should, I think these are U's, actually. And I, I'll maybe fix this so we harmonize the notation. But it's equal to the true theory of and error, and that's not equal to the Bs. And since the, the Bs are the things that maximize the R squared, and we're using beta hat, we're going to end up with R squared that's less. So hopefully that's, that's kind of clear. So, so when, we, when, I, when we're saying that, yeah, the, the SNP is only explaining a smaller fraction of the heritability, it's because we're not using the optimal things which maximize the heritability the of the polygenic score. Yeah. Um, we, we, we can calculate. So the Deadweiler formula tells us you know, it's predictable how much less it's going to be. And so that's what the Detweiler formula is that I showed you. Um, but the reason it's less is just generally that we're using the wrong Bs, but just because we don't know them. Any questions about that? Are we happy? Yeah. Great. 
Uh, OK, so next thing. So what happens to the R squared of a score when you add um, more SNPs, right? So there's, there are some reasons that adding SNPs to a polygenic score may cause the R squared to go up. And there's some things that may cause it to go down. So, so imagine that we're just adding one SNP. Though, well, on one hand, let's say that SNP predicts the phenotype. In, in that case, um, you know, we're adding another SNP. It explains more of the variation. And just kind of as a, as a rule of thumb, how much variation it's going to add is going to be related to you know, the, the variance of the, of the term corresponding to that SNP. So this is the genotype for J and the effect of J. And, and so the variance of this is actually equal to that. Right? And so if, if beta is large, then adding the SNP will uh, add more to R squared than if it's little. Same thing if, if, the, if the SNP is rare, it's going to add less. And I have just a little note here. If the SNP is already tagged by things in the score, then it's going to be less than this. But, you know, but it's going to be related to however big this thing is. On the other hand, when we add another SNP, if we don't have the right beta, we're adding noise to the score as well. Right? And the amount of noise in the score is related to, to how much variance there is in, in the x, also the sample size. But, um, so it's related to this thing. And notice that this thing is not a function of b. So every time we add a SNP, we add a, a, you know, a variable amount of signal, but a fixed amount of noise. Um, and so, uh, so if you think about like a pruning and thresholding approach to building a score, you know, we start with the one with the smallest p-value, which is one that's likely to have one of the larger b's, right? And so that's going to give the most signal relative to the noise. And we keep adding them. Um, and as we add more and more SNPs, we're adding SNPs that have less and less signal, but a constant amount of noise every time. And there might be a point at which we're adding more noise than signal. Right? And so you, know, you might think it, it might make sense, especially for traits. Like imagine you get to the point where actually it's, it's like a, a, a trait that's not very polygenic. We might be adding SNPs that actually don't affect the, you know, b is equal to 0. And so we're just adding noise. And so we'd expect the R squared to start going down when we start adding those SNPs. And so you, know, you might think that there's a reason to stop adding them at a certain p-value threshold. In practice, though, for behavioral phenotypes, um, R squared is maximized when you just include all of the SNPs. Um, but like for some phenotypes, you'll we'll see it start dipping as you add more and more SNPs. But it usually doesn't dip by much. I, I think it's not unreasonable just to say, let's include them all. It's not significant. Yeah, yeah. It's not unusual also to see people to choose to like scan across the p-value threshold and, and stop where it's maximized. You'll see people do that. Um, you know, uh, I, I, yeah. You have to be careful about that too because if you if you select the p-value threshold that maximizes the r squared, then you're overfitting at that point, and so you'll get biased estimates in that case. So that's why I, I think for most of the traits we work with, just use all SNPs, and actually just use Bayesian methods. Yeah, it's also, yeah, because the actual threshold, so yes, people often say, well, what's the right thing to do? Yeah. Um, and, and even holding the phenotype constant, um, the right threshold to use here will change depending on how large your sample is. So it's all very complicated. Yeah. And also the decision whether to include all SNPs. <coughs> height, for example, it's like an inverse U at a current sample size. Is, is it that way? For, I know that's the way for BMI. Is height that way too? I believe so, yeah. Okay. Whereas for EA and you know, cognitive like test scores, it just se seems to increase, like Patrick said. But there's no reason it would necessarily do that if the GWAS had had 10 million people in it. Yeah. 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 At some point, it's going to start to come down, potentially. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. Great. Any, any questions about this? OK, I think I just have two more things, maybe three. Um, OK, so this is something that I, I talked about briefly. And I just want to explain a bit more carefully uh, what I meant by this. OK, so, so th there are um, two, two reasons why if we use a polygenic score, it's hard, like in, a, in our analysis, um, that it's, well, there's lots of reasons why it's hard to interpret. But there's two statistical reasons related to measurement error why it's a bit tricky. Um, and, and the first one is just attenuation bias, right? So we, we, had, we had our slide about that already. You know, when we use a polygenic score that's estimated in a finite sample, um, it'll attenuate the betas. And, and, you know, and so that all of a sudden means that the effects that we're measuring is a function of just the discovery sample size. And that's not very interesting, because that doesn't represent something like real. Right? And so, so that's one problem. Um, the other problem is, uh, in practice, when we make polygenic scores, we usually, before we run our analysis, we standardize them. So they're variance one, right? Um, but that puts us in kind of weird units, right? Because the variance of the polygenic score that we estimate 
is equal to the variance of the true polygenic score plus the variance of the noise, which is bigger than, you know, what we'd ideally want to do is just divide by the variance of the polygenic score. So we would be in units of like polygenic score units, right? So we're dividing by something that's too big, which actually will inflate our, um, inflate our, our estimates if we use the polygenic score in a regression. And so there's these two things that are pushing things in opposite directions and generally just making, you know, ideally what we'd want to do is say, well, what would happen if we had the true polygenic score? What would, what would be the coefficient that we'd get in that case? Um, and, you know, and, and doing, based on the way that we do things, that's, it's not getting that. There, there are, a nice thing though, is both of these problems are related to just this term here, this variance of u, and there's ways to estimate it. And since we kind of know what this is, you'd think that there are ways that we can correct um, for these problems. And that's actually something that um, uh, SSJC folks are, are working on, is coming up with a, a simple way to make corrections on polygenic scores to get us back in these units. Um, but until then, uh, just keep in mind that there are, um, you know, interpreting scores is a bit funny because of these two forces due to measurement error. So it seems, I haven't thought this through, but it seems intuitively that measurement there would be an even bigger problem in if you're interacting the score with some environmental variable, and it goes back to Matt's earlier talks. Now, we thought it was all about what kind of biases might show up when you're doing a naive gene by, like, environment by polygenic score interaction. I thought a little bit about it. Yeah. We should, I should show you some stuff. Okay. It's tricky. It is so, okay. but, but I think it's fixed, like, it's doable still, but it's tricky. Um, uh, if, if, if the score is uncorrelated with the environmental thing, okay. then it's actually pretty easy. Okay. But um, imagine that's a situation that a lot of people in this room will find themselves in. A lot of yeah, people yeah. Like that, so yeah, it's yeah. Um, but it is, it's a hard problem. Uh -huh. So what is the advice for people? Yeah, so what's the practical? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know. Really wait, wait, wait to find. I mean, like, you know, people are currently doing without dealing with these problems. I mean, just understanding that, yeah, well, I mean, it's hard because these two things go in opposite directions, right? Um, we've, been, we've been trying to find time to solve this problem for a while. I, I, I wanted to be able to show you the equation of how to fix it. We just haven't had time before the meeting started. Um, but, but I think just being aware that this is here uh, is, is a useful first step. Um, I think in general, well, you know, I don't actually even know which one of these is bigger off the top of my head. I think that, I actually don't know. I, I think that this one's probably bigger, but I'm just guessing. We need to, we need to work it out. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we good? Um, great. So we, I mentioned this a little bit, um, and I just want to hit this a bit harder again. So, so let's say that we have, we make our polygenic score, and we didn't perfectly, okay. Well, there's two ways that stratification can really hurt us with polygenic scores. And so, so first off, in the prediction sample, right? So, so you might have two groups where the um, allele frequencies are different across causal SNPs between the two groups. Um, and so that might lead to mean differences in the polygenic scores between the two groups. It kind of relies on there being um, a relationship between the effect sizes and the mean differences. But if there is a small empirical relationship between the two, that means that our polygenic score may capture non-genetic. So even, even if our betas are perfectly estimated with no bias, um, the polygenic score may by chance capture some of these non-genetic differences just because the actual mean, the small mean differences between the polygenic scores and the two groups. All right, so, so this is, you know, if you're, if you're a little bit unlucky, in, in general, this by itself is maybe expected to not be very big, okay? The next thing is that in discovery, let's say that we, in, in the discovery sample, where we're estimating our betas, if there's stratification, then that's going to lead to bias for all the reasons that we talked about. And so we're going to pass in um, betas that are perhaps too big um, a, or just generally wrong. And so this will lead to bias in our follow-up analyses because we're using these bias estimates of beta. And so that's, you know, but maybe that's not a huge deal as long as we've uh, controlled for stratification in our prediction sample. You know, so this is maybe a problem. Maybe it's not a huge problem. Together, it's a very big problem because where there are SNPs, where there are mean differences between the groups, you're going to get estimates that are, well, let's, let's, let's say that in population one, um, there's a 
large, it has a larger mean due to non-genetic reasons, um, and it also has a higher allele frequency. In those cases, your betas will be too large, but also the differences in allele frequency will, will capture these non-genetic differences. And so it compounds and, and leads to like, really huge predicted differences between your two groups based on the polygenic scores. And this leads to the kinds of things that Alicia pointed out um, in Finland, where there's, uh, you know, between East and West Finland, based on the polygenic scores, you'd, you'd predict like a three centimeter difference, or I don't remember exactly what the numbers were, but differences that were much larger than the observed differences. Um, and you, you know, I saw a paper once that it was predicting differences between like Jews and Lutherans in Minnesota, but if you actually look at the numbers, you know, I think that those are much larger than, than the, the, the polygenic score predicts much bigger differences than is actually observed phenotypically. And I think what's happening is this compounding of a little bit of stratification in the prediction sample, a little bit of stratification in the discovery sample that just works together in really perverse ways. So, so that's an that's um, important thing to keep in mind as, as well. Small, small amounts of stratification can cause big problems in polygenic scores if you don't control carefully. We good? Is there any more? Oh, here's another one. Oh, this is one that I'm a bit embarrassed to show you the slide for um, because I don't have a really solid answer. Um, but, but it came up, and so I wanted to see, you know, we've thought about it, and we think we have a little bit of a grasp. If there are other people here who um, have a better answer than what I'm going to say here, then let's chat about it. But okay, so, so genome-wide significance, we use 5 times 10 to the negative 8 to correspond to like a 0.05 p-value. And so that's kind of implying that there are like a million effective tests that we're running in a genome-wide association study, right? Because it's 0.05 divided by a million. Um, when we're doing prediction, I showed you this you know, nice little Deadweiler formula, and I said, okay, well, you know, it's, it's going to, um, you know, we re need to rescale it based on the effective number of, of SNPs that we include in our polygenic score. And I told you that was 60,000. And so these two numbers seem to be at odds, right? Because you know, the effective number of tests, that's if it's one test per SNP, and then I tell you that there's uh, 60 effective SNPs when we're doing a polygenic score, um, those are really different, you know, different numbers. And so why is there the difference? And I, and I, think, I think what's going on, and you know, what I think's going on is that when you're doing statistical testing, that actually has most, most to do with like, the number of SNPs that you're analyzing. So you know you have you have you're adding more and more SNPs, you're getting more and more tests. Um, whereas for the polygenic score, what's relevant is like the effective population size, the number of haplotypes that exist in, in your data. And so that number might be a lot less than the number of effective SNPs that we're including, but but they're not exactly the same thing. You can have a haplotype with a handful of SNPs on, like a bunch of different SNPs on them. Um, and and so they, they they may not be exactly the the, the same thing. I wish I could be more clear than that, but, uh, but I, I think that's the source of the, of the difference. Um, that, you know, one's about SNPs and one's just about, you know, haplotype blocks. <coughs> um, I think that's, that, that is the last slide. So, yeah. So, sorry this is maybe unsatisfying, <laughs> but, but, but where, where there is a difference, and I, and I, and I think it's because, you know, statistical testing and prediction are, are different things. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.